So good morning to everyone, though I can't see you. I'm happy that you are with us this morning. My name is Rhonda Bivens Talley. Um, I am currently the director of the uh, Levesque Institute at Niagara University. I also serve as the director of IMPACT, which stands for Innovative Mission Projects, Accelerating Community Transformation. And I also am the coordinator for what we call at the Niagara University, a group of students that are our Brennan Scholars, and they are our uh, first generation college student. So I am also, I wear a lot of hats, um, but I enjoy them all and um, I'm glad to be here today. And with me today we have. Hi everyone, my name is Shaquita Wilson. I am a licensed master social worker. Um, I'm licensed both in the state of New York and in the state of Virginia. I currently live in Virginia um, where I work part-time as a school social worker. And then I also do private practice as well. She does. So thank you, Shaquita. So we'll go ahead and get started today. Our topic today, of course, is building a case management structure that actually helps people. And the reason we chose that topic is because we know that as social workers, I am a social worker, but I'm an educator by trade. And Shaquita, she told you, is a licensed master social worker. But we come from two different perspectives. But at the end of the day, when we came together and we had this discussion, we realized that people talk about case management, they do case management as well as social work, but is it really effective? And what does it take to really be effective in case management and really help people? So we are going to have that discussion with you today. All right. So what is case management? When we talk about case management, we can look at it from the national uh, social worker standards, or we can look at case management in general. Um, for us, we looked at it from the National Association of Social Workers standards because we are social workers, but not everyone has to be a uh, social worker to do case management. But according to the National Association of Social Work, it's the process of assessing a client and the client's family's needs when appropriate. And also uh, social workers are arranging, coordinating, monitoring, evaluating, and advocating multiple services to meet specific needs of the clients. So in a nutshell, what you're doing is you're identifying what the problems are that a person has, looking for resources for that person, um, empowering them um, along the way and, and utilizing those resources and making sure that there's a positive outcome and monitoring the progress as you go through um, working with them. So when you look at the different models, so everything that we do is actually based on um, on different models, right? So depending on the uh, situation that you're in, the type of um, social work that you're doing or case management that you're doing, you're gonna be working under a different model uh, of case management. And there are four basic models that we've listed here for you to identify the differences. And I said, as I said earlier, Shaquita and I work from two of these different management models. So the brokerage model is a case management model that is really the brief, the most um, is the briefest model because you don't do as much. You're focused on evaluating the needs of the person, you're referring them to services, and then you make sure that you supervise the ongoing treatment. So you're not doing as much one-on-one. -on -one. You may not have um, as many steps for the person because what you're doing is identifying the need. And it's almost like, almost, uh, like case uh, crisis management where you're looking at this is what I see as the problem, and now I'm going to refer you out to make sure you get the help that you need. So you are not the middle person that keeps going back and forth and monitoring what's happening with the uh, with the client or the student in that case. Um, Shaquita always says clients, and I say students because I work directly with students, and she works directly with clients. So when you look at the clinical case management model, and this is where uh, Shaquita lives, um, this is a higher degree of responsibility than the brokerage model because you're going to be pro providing them with a, a variety of services. So it may be educational, workforce services, intensive case management. So there are a number of services that you're referring them to, and you're monitoring all of those services and doing the case management with the person in the process. So you do a lot of, uh, rather than just uh, referring a person out, you're actually doing a lot of the case management with the person one-on-one. -on -one. And then with the strength-based models, this is where I work most of the time with my students, is we're looking at um, what are the strengths of the students without overlooking what their shortcomings may be, right? But we're going to focus on the strengths because we want them to feel good about themselves, we want to empower them, and we want to work from a patient-centered um, aspect so that they feel confident in working with us, and we want to provide um, a groundwork 
for a tailored plan by identifying what those strengths are and then working our plan around what those strengths are to move forward. So it does require time, it, it requires relationship building, it requires you to take the time to get to know the students to identify what those strengths are without overlooking the weaknesses, but not being as focused on them so that you help get the student a, a win right from the beginning. And this is where uh, Shaquita lives, so I'll let her handle this, this uh, slide here. <laughs> the intensive, intensive case management model, um, it delivers high quality services in short um, in a short amount of time. And that's oftentimes we'll get a client in and clients have so much going on that you kind of have to get that assessment done and jump right into whatever the needs that they discuss in that assessment. Because sometimes clients are transient, um, they may not stay in care as much. So you want to be able to tackle um, as much as you can while you have them. Um, so you're providing that individual attention, um, you're providing that mental health care, rehabilitation, social support um, over an unspecified period of time. So it can be some clients, they may, they may be, be with you for one month, some may be with you for one year. Um, some clients, if they are very good with staying in care, um, they may be with you for, for years at a time, but the, the the whole goal is to move them out of care and get them to a point where they're able to do things on their own once you link them to these necessary supports that they need. Um, we offer 24 hour support, of course, in clinics. Um, clinics close at a certain time, but some clinics have after hours. Um, a lot of clinics now are having these after hours clubs. They have after hours crisis, uh, crisis services. And then of course, we also link clients with the, the other crisis services department in their state. Um, so that's the, that's the goal is to have clients have all the support that they need so they can become more independent. We don't want clients to stay dependent on our services. We want them to be able to be independent and do what they can do on their own. Right. And even though we're showing you the different models, it's possible that you may be starting with one model and you may use some of the different um, strategies from each of the models to actually move the person along, because we have to keep in mind that everything is individualized. I do a lot of uh, group sessions and I don't do as much case management and one on one. But what I do is I work with our groups and I still have to do some of the same steps, follow the same steps in all the procedures and use the same strategies across the board, across all of these models actually get to the outcome for even our groups of students that we may be working with. Because as we said, in the end, we're identifying what the needs um, of each of the persons are individually, and but we may be doing that through a group setting. So what are some of the key principles of effective case management? So of course it starts with building relationships. Um, in uh, education, we often talk about the three R's being reading, writing, and arithmetic. But in social work, when we look at those things, we look at it being uh, relevance, rigor, and then relationships. And relationships often comes in last, but it's the most important because if you don't have a relationship with your client or your student, it's gonna be hard to build uh, trust. It's gonna be hard to work with them and it's gonna be hard to move them along. And you have to know a person in order to figure out just what their needs are. And it takes time, it takes patience, and it takes a lot of understanding to do that. And of course, we always use an evidence-based model um, to determine how we're going to be doing these things because you're in the end, you want to be able to evaluate, make sure that what you're doing, um, um, you can demonstrate the effectiveness of what you're doing. Throughout the process, you're going to be empowering your client or your student, and you're going to be selling up, setting up uh, ways for them to have small wins along the way. So you don't have to look at, you know, what's our overall goal. We look at setting SMART goals, the short-term and the long-term goals. So that along the way, they're getting those um, small wins and having those successes and feeling confident about themselves, working with you and what you're doing. And more importantly, the plan that you're putting in place for them, right? So they can see it working. Um, they could see that um, they can trust what you're saying and trust the, your judgment about putting these things in place. Everything that you're doing is uh, centered around the client. So you don't necessarily create a plan without the client. In fact, you absolutely don't create the plan without the client. You make sure that they are part of the process and that's very important in building the relationship with them. Uh, people don't want to be told what to do. They want to be advised about how to get something done. So um, we also want to create a continuum of support. So we want them to realize that their village is much larger than just you. Shaquita um, spoke earlier to the fact that you don't want them dependent on services. You also don't want them dependent on you. We want to learn, we want them to learn to um, seek out their own services at some point, be self-sufficient and also be dependent, independent, I'm sorry. 
And then the idea is we want to plan for tomorrow. You can't plan for yesterday. Oftentimes people are trying to make up time. They're they're stuck in what happened yesterday or you know years ago. And sometimes there are um, there are traumas that hold people back um, and keep them from progressing. What we want them to do is really think about where they're going. Right. We don't want people to get stuck in um, what they can't change. We'll give empower them um, with knowledge and information and resources so that they feel that they can move forward. So the goals of case management include enhancing the development, problem solving and coping capacities of the client or the student, providing them with resources and services um, and linkages to other people and systems so that they understand that there is a wider range of resources available to them. And that often happens. People don't realize uh, they've been stuck in a place or they stopped asking for help because they feel as if though they have not been able to make um, connections, right? Or sometimes people give them just minimal information. So it's important that when a person, when you're planning things, it's not to overwhelm them, but to give them the 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 um, the the way to see the pathway clearly, but help them to understand that these are just going to be small steps, incremental steps that they're going to be taking and in, in getting those small wins along the way. So it's not to overwhelm them, but to make sure that they're well informed, um, so that they know what their next steps are and can be confident in taking those steps. So Shaquita, can you um, take this next slide for me? <clears throat> yes. So managing outcomes. Um, we want to do ongoing assessment. So once we link a client to a service, we want to make sure that they, they are continuing to get the support that they need. So we're going to continue to do ongoing assessment. Is this working for you? Is this not working for you? Do you need something additional? Um, identifying goals with the client. You always want to make sure that we have goals. Um, sometimes when, for me, when clients come into therapy, um, they have different outlooks on what therapy is. So I constantly have to tell them, okay, what are your goals? What do you want to work on? What are, you know, so we always want to identify, have goals, have objectives, and have um, develop and implement those interventions. Um, we're going to evaluate the results of the intervention. In, in clinics, we normally are doing, uh, we were doing treatment plans every three months, and then they jump to us being able to do them once a year if we wanted to. But no matter how often you're going to do a treatment plan, you want to always be evaluating the results of the intervention along the way. And you want to make revisions as needed um, that are patient-centered. Always keep in mind that it is about the patient or the client. Um, it is not, it's not about us. It's not about our goals. It's about the client's goals. Right. So keys to building structure. You want to be consistent. The most important thing is to establish a routine. If you tell a person that you want them to come every Thursday at four o'clock, then you need to make sure that you are there every Thursday at 4 p.m. Um, and you, if you give a person a directive, you want to follow up and make sure that they are following that directive so that you do establish a routine. And sometimes establishing that routine takes time because things do happen. Things get in the way. Sometimes, uh, our patients and our students are dealing with mental health challenges um, and life just happens sometimes. Sometimes something just unplanned um, happens, but the idea is it's okay that it happened this week. Let's get back to what we were doing so that you continue with that, that consistency every week. Then we have to think about predictability, predictability, like what is likely to happen? If you are going to send someone, um, let's say they have to take public transportation, right? What is likely to happen from A to B? And you have to plan for all of those things in between. Um, is, it is, is it likely that a person could uh, miss a bus and have to take uh, transfer to another bus, right? Wait for another bus. Have you given them all those tools? Have you given them all the information that they need in case there's a hiccup along the way? Um, what happens in my case, if a student is not going to, let's say they have a chemistry exam coming up and they're not doing well in chemistry and they are not going to the tutor the likelihood is they're not going to do well in that test on that midterm. And then we're going to have to come up with a plan or they're going to end up on academic probation. So what are we planning in the process, right? So as we're establishing these routine, establishing these routines, what we want to do is make sure we're thinking about all the things that could possibly happen along the way and then putting in those resources and services that they may need to be successful. And then we want to have follow through. Say what you mean and mean what you say. If people feel that you are saying one thing and doing another, they're not going to trust your authority. They're not going to trust what you're saying. They're not going to trust your judgment. And more than likely, they're not going to want to continue their sessions with you. 
So you want to make sure that you are following through. It's very important because just as you want them to follow through, they want you to follow through as well because they're depending and counting on you as well. And in the end, who's accountable for what? So that's why we're doing all these things. We're being consistent. We're making sure that we're planning for things that may or may not happen. We're following through on things we said we're going to do because we have to say, well, it was your responsibility to get to, you know, to class on time. It was your responsibility, right? I said I would reach out to your professor. I did that. So we have to make sure that when we say that we're doing things that we do them so that we can say, well, who was accountable for that, right? Who was supposed to have done what, right? And then making sure we're, we're making sure that um, we're doing what we say. So what are some of the key characteristics of exception, exceptional case managers? Now, um, I actually have a plaque on my desk that says that I am the director of awesomeness because so many things happen and, and um, I do a lot with crisis, uh, crisis management and we have to think on the spot sometimes, right? So you have to be a person that is flexible. In this field of work, you definitely have to be flexible. You have to, you can't be too rigid. Uh, your clients have a number of needs and it's not a nine to five job. One of the things I will say about any student I've worked with that goes into social work, don't expect that you're going to be in the office at 8.30 and out the door all the time at 4.30 because people have needs and it's really about you're being client focused, um, student focused. And if a person comes in your door at 4.20, you can't say, oh, I can't see you right now. You have to come back tomorrow because you don't know if that person is in a crisis. And what you don't want to do is be responsible for a person um, ending up in a situation um, that you were responsible for that you could have prevented. So we want to make sure that we're patient, we're always being supportive, we're trustworthy, skilled, compassionate, uh, we have integrity, we're active listeners, we communicate well with our, our clients. If you can't be in your office some, uh, for a day, don't let the person come all the way to your office and uh, you know you didn't notify them. It takes a phone call, it takes just a minute to let a person know that you're unavailable. And in saying that you're unavailable, don't just say you're unavailable. When will you see them next, right? Um, you want to make sure that you're organized. You want to make sure that you're thorough. Now, those are just some of the things that I think are key characteristics. Um, are there any of you, if you would like to put in the chat box, what do you think are some of the characteristics that maybe you think are um, important for case management or when you work with students or just clients in general? You can feel free to just put some things in the chat. Okay, no takers. <laughs> okay, that's okay. Okay, so what we want to do is introduce a case study to you. And actually the case study is our client here, our, um, who was my student, my former student, Shaquita Wilson. Um, and I met Shaquita when she was in high school in 12th grade. And I feel that rather than talking about a subject, it's always good to show an outcome. We talked earlier about the importance of outcomes. And what I'm fortunate to be able to do is anytime I'm talking about any subject, nine times out of 10, there's a student that can tell the story better than I can. So I think it's important to show your outcomes. And this is one way that I do that. So um, as I introduced myself before, my name is Shaquita and I am going to, I put, I put this case study and I wrote it out on here so that way I don't go off on a tangent. Um, so, when I started high school, I went to Grover Cleveland High School in Buffalo, New York, which is now International Preparatory at Grover. So if you was to look at it, you probably, you, you wouldn't see Grover Cleveland anymore because they changed the name. I was actually the last graduating class of Grover Cleveland High School. Um, and at the time they had a health occupations and tech, technology program um, or the HOT program is what we called it. And in that program, you were able to basically get your CNA, your Certified Nursing Assistant License. So we joined the program and then a branch off to the program was the Nursing Workforce Diversity Program. And that's where I met Ms. Rhonda. And I think I met Ms. Rhonda probably, I think maybe my, my sophomore or junior year actually, yes. um, because the program lasted, I think about three years. So um, you, had the, you have these two programs and both programs were providing us with uh, the knowledge, the training and the certification to start a career. Um, at the time, the goal was to start a career in nursing. Um, so we did a lot of extracurriculum activities in the NWD program. 
we went to colleges, they had speakers come to us. Um, those speakers were nurse practitioners, nurses. Um, we was able to go and we uh, visited different colleges. So we were at Duville College, which is one of the, the places I attended. We, we were at Niagara University and we were also um, at NCCC. So did you have any comments? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> And so we um, attended these colleges. We were able to get a get a feel for what college courses were. Um, we took, I think, a chemistry course over the summer because NWD did a summer program for us. So during that time, we were on a college campus. We were able to get the feel for what it was like to be in college, um, which was very awesome because it helped you prepare for what you wanted to do in the future. So we took, um, we were able to take some college courses. We were able to stay on campus, which was awesome. Um, NWD also provided us with a stipend um, and we had bus passes, bus tokens. Um, and they also provided that support with applying to college, which a lot of us in, in an inner city high school, um, we didn't have anyone who went to college prior to us. so. Um, that process was very, very um, discouraging if you were to just do it on your own. So it was awesome to have them there. Um, they also provided us with SAT prep um, to also let us know what we had to look for with applying to some of the colleges. So we had an idea of what college we were actually able to get into um, and which ones we may have to work a little bit harder at um, trying to attend. So, right. So you may be wondering, well, how are we able to do all of these things? So all these things happen through a partnership with the um, Buffalo um, Public Schools, but also with the Uval College. And uh, we wrote a HRSA grant. So it was a multi-year grant. And we looked at what were some of the deficits, right? We were looking at two things. We were looking at the shortages in healthcare professions. We were looking at the fact that there were very many uh, minorities in those health professions. And we looked at, well, how do we increase the quality of care and how do we increase the number of um, uh, people, minorities in those professions, as well as how do we prepare students um, and increase the graduation rates? Because at the time, the graduation rate, when we looked at Buffalo um, at um, East High School at the time and at Grover Cleveland, the graduation rate was somewhere around 36%. So we looked at, um, look at all of the different, um, uh, I'm sorry, the um, I guess I would say we looked at a number of things, right? So we look at all the deficits. So we're looking at graduation rates with the schools. We were looking at um, creating these health professionals. And then we were also looking at how do we really um, change the trajectory of the lives of the students that we were working with at the time. So um, this grant that we received was a multi-year grant. It was a $1.5 million grant. And we had that grant actually for uh, six years. And it was actually an exemplary program because of all the things that we did and the partnerships that we were able to create and also the outcomes that we had. So at the time that the students were participating in the class, as I said, their graduation rate at the time was 36%. When we were working with the students, there were different cohorts of students over those six years. Each cohort, each cohort had a graduation of uh, 96%. I think that was our lowest of the five of the six years. Our lowest was 96%. All of our students that were in our program otherwise had 100% graduation rate, and all of them were accepted into college. So that was a, it was a magnificent program, but it it did require uh, a lot of financial um, backing in order to be able to make these provisions for our students. So I, at the time, so my, my senior year, um, I think everything that could go wrong in life just went wrong my senior year of high school. Um, I was not, we had to, to move out of our house. So we were living with, with others and, and practically homeless. And I just was determined that I, I still wanted to go to school because at this point, a college degree only sounded correct. <laughs> like I told myself, you can only go up from here. We are at rock bottom. You can only go up from here. So um, I was determined to, to go to school. And at the time I wanted to go to school for nursing. And so NWD helped me uh, to get into Duval College and not only get into Duval, they helped me to get into the HEOP program. Um, HEOP stands for, oh goodness. Um, Higher Education Opportunity Program. Um, and so, it feels like it's been a decade. 
Um, and so ATOP provides you once again with the support you need, um, especially for those first generation college students. So they walk you through the whole process with ATOP. You actually start school in July instead of August. So you get an opportunity to stay on campus. Um, you start to take uh, almost like remedial courses when you're at HEOP. Um, HEOP provides you with scholarships because it's a scholarship program. So I didn't have to come out of pocket for anything during my undergrad um, degree. So that was also awesome. And then you have HEOP counselors and those counselors are there to pr provide you with that, that wide range of support on top of NWD was also housed at Duval College at the time. So I always had that extra support. I never felt like I was alone because going from, just a little bit of background, going from Grover Cleveland High School, which was actually right down the street um, from Duval College, once I got to Duval, it was like two different worlds. Um, I was in a, a, in a place where I went from being in a, a, one of the biggest international schools in Buffalo, New York to a college where I may have been the only person in my classroom that looked like me. So it was very discouraging being in the classrooms versus um, being in, in high school. So I was happy to have, have those supports because if not, I, I probably wouldn't have made it um, because it was just, it, it's very discouraging to be a first generation college student. Um, so for me, I also worked in school while I was in undergrad, which of course they tell you not to do. Um, but the way my lifestyle was and the upbringing that I had, I really couldn't not work. So um, I worked the whole time as a, as a CNA. I did home care and um, I buckled down and, and started this journey. I actually did five years undergrad because HEOP provides you um, with a five-year scholarship. And it helps because I started um, in the career discovery program at Duvill. And that's a program that you get into if your SAT scores or your grades are not high enough to put you right directly into the program of your choice. Um, at the time I wanted to go into nursing. So I was in the career discovery program and I was taking classes geared towards nursing, but you also of course have the opportunity to take other courses such as um, psychology, sociology, your history courses and, and things like that. So um, my initial plan was to go in for nursing and I was really struggling with the fact that I always loved mental health and I was like, oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. And um, once I started to think about changing my major, I had a lot of people telling me um, not to do that. They told me that I should go for nursing. They told me I would not make any money with a bachelor's degree in psychology. Um, and so I spent my first year of undergrad going for nursing. And then I, I had a conversation with my dad and, and he told me, in a very nice way that I needed to use the bathroom or get off the pot. And, and he's like, if you're gonna do psychology, do psychology, if you're gonna do nursing, do nursing. Um, and I just learned that my passion was for mental health. And so I changed my major to psychology after my first year. Um, and I never regretted it. it. I truly, truly enjoyed my psychology courses because it felt like I was learning what I really wanted to do. Um, and the interesting thing is, like I said, I, I did home care and worked as a CNA my whole time. So most people still thought that I, I was graduating with a nursing degree. Um, but in 2015, I graduated with my bachelor's in psychology and I started a journey of wanting to see what life was like outside of Buffalo. So I moved to Florida and um, I read an article prior to me graduating where it said people with their bachelor's degrees are mainly working at Starbucks. And my first job <laughs> was in a maximum security prison as a behavioral health technician and I was on an inpatient mental health unit. So um, it, was, it was very interesting, but that was my first um, my first job in the mental health field, and I'm not sure if anyone knows what it's like working in corrections, but when you work in corrections, 
you see mental health in its raw form. So my first job straight out of school, I, I got the real deal on what it was really like working in the mental health field. Um, and it was an awesome experience because I was able to see um, a lot of what uh, people who work in, the, work in the field don't see if you only work in, in community um, social work or community mental health. So working in corrections, um, it'll, it'll either show you that mental health is what you wanna do or it'll show you it's not. Um, but it was, it was an awesome experience. Um, my supervisors at the time were both clinical psychologists and they told me, of course, you know, you gotta go back for your master's. And at the time I wanted to go for my master's in marriage and family therapy, um, just because I was always just very interested in the family dynamic and um, working with families, keeping families together and things like that. So my supervisors, they were like, no, you go for social work. They're like, if, I, if you don't do anything else, go for social work. They said, if they could go back in time, they would have went and just got their degree in social work. Um, and it's because social work provides you with the flexibility and you're able to work in many different settings as a social worker versus sometimes when you're getting just um, like a marriage and family counseling degree or a mental health counselor degree, um, sometimes you're not able to be as flexible as to where you can go. So I um, applied for my master's program at the University at Buffalo or SUNY UB, and I got accepted and came back home. And um, once I came back home, I started my journey of working in community health. So I worked as a, a harm reduction counselor as um, really my, my, I think probably my whole time in my graduate program. Um, I did the MSW program at UB, worked full time, did the program part time. And that was my first, my first field on working in community health. I did rapid HIV and hepatitis C testing in the community. Um, we did a lot of groups around sexual health and things like that. Um, and so working in the community showed me my passion. My passion was to always work um, in the community and help people to understand how mental health correlates with all the other things that's going on in your life um, and why it's important to get those services and get the support that you need. So I graduated from uh, UB in 2019. And after that, I worked um, at a nonprofit for a few years. And then I started my journey um, working in private practice during the pandemic. I think that that was one of the best things that came out of the pandemic was learning how to get into private practice. Um, so like I said in, in, in my introduction in the beginning, I'm a licensed master social worker. I'm licensed in New York State, and I'm also licensed in the state of Commonwealth, Virginia. Um, I am currently working as a part-time school social worker for one of the school districts here. Uh, and school social work is a little bit different because depending on what you're doing, every school district utilizes their school social workers in a different way. My job primarily is... Uh, getting the background information from the parents. So I do sociocultural with the parents and I do um, what we call adaptive. Um, and I do those assessments with the parents so I can gather that information, write a report and present it in the eligibility meetings for students um, to get either an IEP or a 504 plan. And then I also still do private practice because private practice gives me the opportunity to still do mental health, but I can do it on my terms. Um, I feel like one of the differences between working in an agency and working in private practice is that I can really, really provide the person-centered care that I want. Um, so that, that's one of the things that I enjoy doing. I love working in marginalized communities. Um, like I said, I have a passion for mental health, sexual health, racial equity, and inclusion. At my previous agency, I was um, one of the co-chairs of our uh, racial equity and inclusion committee because I think that that's also very, very important. Right. Um, so yeah. So we look at all these things we look at. Um, when Shaquita was in high school, I told her as well as our uh, president at the time at the uh, at the at Duval College, I said Shaquita is going to be our poster child for nursing workforce diversity, effective case management. And um, and she has become that. 
So what was really wonderful about the connections that we made is that they've remained, we've remained connected. So throughout that process, I had the pleasure of walking her through and walking alongside her with each of those, um, each of those accomplishments. And so when you look at what's really important, it's, it's creating the foundation for a person so that they can build upon that foundation and really, you know, reach for the stars, uh, if you, if per se, because the sky's the limit. Once you have a strong foundation, you're connected, you have resources. Um, we've identified what your strengths are. We connect you to those resources and then you get those small wins. And what happened with Shaquita is when she never really liked, she never, not really, but she never liked confidence. What she did not have was information and, and she did not know how to make the connections in order to reach the goal that she wanted, which was to be, um, at the time she thought it was a nurse, but she found along the way that her passion truly was in um, providing services to people in health and human services and in social work. So again, what we find that was effective, it was the relationship, it was the resources, um, and it was really empowering a person to be able to do what it is that they want to do that makes them successful. And it makes you successful as a case manager or social worker. Yes, I have never not in any journey that I've done consulted Ms. Rhonda. <laughs> like every step of the way, I have consulted and spoke with Ms. Rhonda with my my different journeys in life. And I've always received that that support. So um it 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 takes one person sometimes. It takes one person. I can I can truly tell you that. Right. So when we provide all these resource supports where this all started, she talked, she started from the beginning. She talks about where it all started. And when we um, were with the students, what we were looking at were the social determinants of health at the time. And what were all these things that the students needed? And what we implemented were things like the 40 developmental assets, right? So it's a program through the Search Institute where you kind of look at the assets of, that a, a person has. And particularly we were working with youth. So we looked at these assets. And when we did this evaluation, we looked at out of the 40 assets, these students possessed under 19, which the target goal is 19. So what we did is we developed our program around the assets that we wanted to build for the students. So whether it was directly with us um, through case management, whether it was something in the community, something with the school system, what we did is we put those resources in place in front of them and allowed them to increase their assets through those different activities. And we found that it was very successful and we continued to use that model year after year. So um, in addition to the financial support, what we wanted was for them not to have to work. We wanted them to be able to look at getting a stipend, having the money, not be concerned about working, let's say at Tops or a Walmart or something um, for 10 or 15 uh, hours a week. We provided them with a stipend so that they could focus on their, on their studies. So we did what was called earn and learn at the time. And the more you went to um, the library, the more you went with your mentor, the more you went to a career services or academic services for help, the more you got paid, right? So you could you could work up to, I think it was 25 hours that you could earn. Um, and I think it was 10 or $15 um, a stipend that you would receive. So we made sure that we were removing barriers that kept them from being successful. And we wanted them to see that with help, with resources, and more importantly, stepping outside of your comfort zone. So we were exposing them to things that they wouldn't ordinarily be exposed to. Shaquita spoke earlier to the fact that we did summer camps and we took them to uh, science museums and we did took them into hospitals, we needed them to see things other than what was just in their environments. So when you take people outside of their environments, they often flourish. And we found that that was exactly the case with our students. So we continued to do that year after year. And each time um, when we were doing these things and doing the planning, the students were part of the planning. We would give an evaluation of every activity that we did. And we would ask them, well, what did you think about that? How do we make it better? So that they were part of the process. So each year that they came back into the program, it was not the same program. And it was never doing the same things over and over. It was really more and more exposure to do things and really taking them again outside of their comfort zones, exposing them to things that they wouldn't ordinarily be exposed to that they didn't see all the time. Um, and the other thing, I was very, very involved with the students. Um, I spent the night in the dorms with the students. I went to lunch with the students. I did all those things. And I was also the person that did home visits. Um, those were not things that they were doing in the uh, Buffalo schools. They certainly were not doing them um, in, the, in the college at all. But I thought it was important to understand the students, where they come from, where they lived, and some of the things that they dealt with. Um, at the time, there was a lot the students were dealing with um, when it came to they were losing friends. Um, there was a lot of turnover in their school, so there was no consistency with the education. And we made sure we wanted them to have 
uh, consistency, and we wanted them to have support regardless of what happened. So we even helped to um, put chemistry in their school because they were in a program designed to get them into nursing and there was no chemistry. So there was a lot of advocacy that went on um, with our students. So a lot of it, um, which seemed behind the scenes in order for them to be successful. But at the end of the day, we were able to take measurement, all of these things and how effective these things were. And um, in addition to um, what's happened with Shaquita, we've seen a number of the students. And even though they did not have straight paths the way Shaquita did, um, taking advantage of those things, some of those students, it may have taken them a year, it may have taken them two years, but because they had that foundation when they were ready, they then took advantage of opportunities and I got the phone calls from them too. And even though I was no longer in the program, I was I was accessible. I was always accessible and they could find me and I always kept up with my students. And to this day, I keep up with my students. Um, so whether it's uh, now I'm going to graduations, I'm going to weddings, I'm going to, you know, um, what else am I going to? I'm going to concerts now with my students because they're all adults. Um, so, you know, it was the relationship building that made it important, but they always knew that there was a person that they could rely on. And if it wasn't me being available, I made sure there was someone else that was available for the students. So there was always someone to count on. Um, and, and I'm happy to say that uh, Shaquita is just one of our success stories, but uh, she too is now in the position where she is now giving back to her community, giving back to other students. And she speaks with me um, in classrooms and, uh, and helps students to understand and know that they just have to take the first step and there will always be someone there to walk alongside you if you just do that. So as Shaquita said earlier, it just takes that one person to believe in you and to want to foster some growth and development in you. The question that we really want to know is, are you that one person? Are you doing all that you can do to help a person? Because it doesn't take much. <laughs>